This chapter, we're going to talk about um, corporations and stock transactions, as well as how they pay out dividends. So these are our learning objectives. <clears throat> the characteristic of a corporation is that it is a separate legal entity that can enter into contracts in its own name. It can purchase property in its own name. Um, it can sell, like it says, most importantly, sell stock. Um, and, and it exists outside of the owners. So we have stockholders who have shares of stock in it, but those stockholders can die and that corporation is going to continue to exist. Um, so like I said, the stockholders are who own it. So they, but you can, you could sell your shares of stock at any time. Even if you're a majority stockholder, a lot of times you have to, um, you, you can't dump it in the market, but you can still sell it. So, um, so that's how you buy and sell in, in corporations is you buy shares of stock. And they're normally sold in the open market where anyone can purchase them. Um, there can be private corporations that are not sold in the open market and maybe they're employee owned or family owned. Um, but the benefit of, the, of the being a stockholder is that you have limited liability. The most that you can lose if that company, say, went under or got sued or had some sort of horrible loss is what you've invested in it. So whatever value you paid to buy those shares of stock, that is the only thing that's at risk. They can't come back and they can't sue you or go after any of your personal assets. Stockholders control the corporation by electing a board of directors. There's different rules involved that those board of directors um, should not, you know, they really should be a little bit like hands length away from the corporation so that they are able to make um, like unbiased type decisions on the on the long term on long term um, outlook of that company. And then that board of directors, the CEO of the company is going to report directly to them. So here's our here's our corporate structure. So our stockholders are the owners. They elect the board of the directors, the officers of the company report back to the board of directors, and then the employees report to all the officers. So the one of the bummers or disadvantages of a corporation is what we call double taxation. So double taxation means the corporation files a tax return and they pay taxes on their net income. Then their dividends are paid out of the debt, out of that net income to the stockholders. And then the stockholders will also receive a 1099 that, of the dividend income, and they have to report it on their tax return and then pay taxes on those dividends. So corporations, if they're paying dividends, there's double taxation. So this gives you a nice little summary of the advantages and disadvantages, so you can read that over. Um, it's definitely a little harder to form a corporation than it is to be a sole proprietor or to be a partner. Um, those are easier to form. The corporations have to normally contact an attorney and like I said, have a board of directors and um, have the board of directors meet on important decisions and guide them accordingly. Um, then here they're showing you Delaware is the is a state that many companies incorporate in if they're going to do business across the um, you know, nation and or the world because they have more favorable laws that favor corporations. Um, there'll, there'll be a charter of articles of incorporation within that state and it'll, it'll um, kind of outline or uh, sorry, outline their bylaws and that they need to follow as a corporation. So you'll have legal fees, taxes, state incorporation fees, um, license fees. And then in order to go public, then you'll have to try to, you know, you'll want to get your shares of stock out there too. So there can be promotional costs involved. All of these expenses could be thousands and thousands of dollars. But when we incur them, we're going to debit an account called organizational expenses. So here's the journal entry for that. So as those are paid, we charge that off to expense. And in the stockholders equity section of our balance sheet, we will have um, the common stock and the paid in capital. All of that's going to go into what they call contributed, contributed capital or the paid in capital account. 
and then and then our retained earnings, our net income will roll into our retained earnings. Excuse me. Okay. So then we have um, the stockholders' equity. Then it's showing you that it is the the money coming in from our from our investors. And then whatever earnings we retain in the company. And then our, whoops, sorry, let me go back. Our dividends are paid out of those retained earnings and come out of our stockholders' equity account. So our net income increases retained earnings. Our dividends decrease retained earnings. And retained earnings normal balance is a credit balance. If it would ever go into the debit, it would be because they have a loss. So if instead of having net income, they have net loss, that, and then it would have to obviously be kind of years and years, um, but then that's gonna end up creating a deficit in that retained earnings. So then the companies that are publicly traded issue stock and they would have common stock and preferred, they, they will definitely have common stock, they could have preferred stock and anything that's been issued and is still in the hands of the stockholders, we call that outstanding stock. Authorized shares are ones that they're allowed to sell, but it doesn't mean they have to sell them all. So we have these three categories. Again, authorized is the big picture to say that's how much we're allowed to sell. Issue is what we have sold. Outstanding is what is still in the hands of our current investors. Um, shares are issued out at par value, um, and normally that's a small amount, maybe a dollar par value, five dollars par value. Again, it's normally going to be a minimum amount, and we call that their legal capital. It could also be stated value instead of par value, in which case there's no par, but there is a stated value associated with it. The rights to a, um, the owners of a corporation is that they have the right to vote in matters that concern like the future of that corporation. They will have the right to dividends if the company chooses to pay those, and those dividends are a distribution of the earnings. And then if the company were to go under, they would have the right to any remaining assets, just like we talked about in that partnership, if a partnership. So like I said a few slides back, all publicly traded companies have to have common stock. They can choose to have preferred stock if they wanted to. The reason we call it preferred stock is because it has the preference to dividends, and so they'll get paid their dividends first. And then if we were going into that liquidation, they would get their money out before the common stockholders would. So here they tell you, um, the dividends are either going to be stated at a per share, like $4 per share, or a percent, like 8%. So however they tell us is how we'll have to compute it. And like I said, they're preferred because they get the first rights to the dividends. And then they and then um, the company, though, can not guarantee those dividends. So we have two different types. Um, that will that that could happen in those preferred stockholders, but the preferred stockholders get their money first, and if there's anything left over, it goes to the common stockholders. So these are the two types. It could be cumulative preferred stock or non-cumulative. So non-cumulative preferred stock means that they do not have the right to get paid any past year's dividends. If the company says, "Hey, we don't have the money to pay the dividends." If it's cumulative, whenever they do have the money, the company's going to have to pay those dividends to the preferred stockholders. If it's non-cumulative, the preferred stockholders just lose that money. They're not going to get it. Um, so again, the, the cumulative gets the dividends that are in arrears. The non-cumulative do not get anything. So here we have an example. They have 1,000 shares of cumulative preferred stock. Um, and they paid no dividends in 2017 or 2018 or 2027 or 28, whatever years those are. Then in 2029, 
The corporation paid $22,000 in dividends, of which $12,000 is paid to the preferred stockholders, and then $10,000 is paid to the common stockholders. So they had 1,000 shares with cumulative dividends of $4 per share, so they owed them for three years. The two years that were in arrears plus the current year. So then, so that's what gets paid first, and then anything remaining is going to go to the common stockholders. Like I said, they would also then have ac they would get um, access to the assets prior to the common stockholders if the company is going out of business. Okay, then when we start to issue out these shares of stock, so you want to understand the journal entries. You know, the cash is going to come in, and then we're going to create a, an account called preferred stock for the preferred shares that were issued. So in this case, 5,000 shares were issued at $100 par. We're going to create an account for common stock. 50,000 shares were issued at $20 par. And those normal balances will be credits, so we are increasing those. Um, now, like it says, though, many times actually most times we're going to issue our stock at a price that is higher than par. So again, when it when that happens, um, it's going to be at a premium. Less often is it sold at a discount, but it is possible to sell it at a discount. Um, so when it's a premium, we receive the cash, we debit that for the price that's paid, we credit our common stock or preferred stock, whatever class of stock it is, for the par amount, and then anything over that goes to paid in capital in excess of par. So then here's a journal entry, 2,000 shares at $55. The preferred stock par value is 50. And then our paid in capital is going to be the extra $5 per share that we got times the 2,000 shares for $10,000. If it was an exchange for common stock for assets, we're going to use the fair value of the assets or the common stock, whichever is more readily determinable. So in this example, the land has a fair value that cannot be, cannot be determined, but the 10,000 shares of stock have a current market price of $12. So then that's what we'll use to value the land. So the land's going to be valued at the price of the 10,000 shares at their $12 market value. And then we would have paid in capital for the $2 a share times the 10,000 shares extra. If it's no par common stock, then we just record it right at the cash received. So we got $400,000 of cash for 10,000 shares that we sold at $40 a share and then we credit our common stock for the $400,000. And then we purchase more, and they, or sorry, we sell out more, and then we do the same thing even if that price changes. So it just goes into that same account. Now, if we have a stated value, it's very comparable to the par value. So the cash comes in at the price we pay, the common stock gets credited at that stated value, and then we have paid in excess. Now, instead of saying of par value, we say of stated value, because again, it's stated value versus par value. Then once we have these stockholders, again, we're, like we already talked a little bit about the preferred stocks, these stockholders expect dividends. So if we have enough retained earnings and we have cash on hand, and the board of directors thinks, okay, I think it's a great idea that we pay, they will elect to pay the cash dividend. Um, but again, like it said, we have to have the retained earnings high enough, and we also have to have the cash balances high enough in order to do it. So there's three dates involved. There's the declaration date, the day the board of directors decides that, yes, we will pay dividends. They will say it's to stockholders of record on a specific date, so whoever owns the stock on that date of record will get the dividend. And then there'll be a payment date maybe a week later or something like that. So we've got, we declare it, we say on this date, whoever holds the stock, they'll get the dividend. And then at some point in time in, in the near future, they'll pay it. So here we have the company that has preferred stock and common stock. Their preferred stock gets a $2.50 dividend. 
and they're going to pay 30 cents dividends to all the common stockholders. So they're going to pay out $42,500 in cash dividends. So on the declaration date, we debit cash dividends and we create a payable. Cash dividends payable for $42,000. Then on the date of the payment, we debit the cash dividends payable and we credit cash. No journal entry on the date of record because all it does is just determine who gets paid. It doesn't change the dollar amount. Now, if the company does not have the cash or if they would like to effectively bring their price down a little bit, their stock price down, they could do a stock dividend instead of a cash dividend. So then um, if they have a 5% stock dividend on 100,000, or sorry, no, on a 2 million shares, that creates 100,000 additional shares that they're going to issue out to record, to the stockholders of record on that date. Then we, dip, we debit stock dividends for the 100,000 shares at the current market value. We credit stock dividends distributable, the 100,000 shares at the par value. And then we have a paid in capital in excess of par for the difference. So then it, um, it does get closed out of our retained earnings, but then that um, common stock distributable and the paid in capital in excess of par common stock are both in the paid in capital section of the balance sheet. Then when the stock dividend is actually paid out in the form of stock, we take it out of the stock dividends distributable, and then we credit out the common stock and we've issued out the new shares. So it doesn't really change anything though. There's really not much of value that they get. How they get value is if the stock price goes up over time. So here it just kind of shows you that, that before the dividend they had 10,000 shares, um, or sorry, they had 1,000 shares of the 10,000 issued, so they had a 10% stake in this company. After the stock dividend, the shares issued go up, their shares go up, but they still have their same 10% holding. Companies can do stock splits if their um, share price gets too high. They may choose to do that because it's basically going to cut the stock's price in half. So if it was selling for $100 after the stock split, it's going to sell for $50, but you're going to have twice as many shares outstanding. So if you add 10,000 shares at $100 par value, with the current price, market price of 150, we're gonna reduce that to say, now in this case, they're not doing just a two for one split, they're doing a five for one split. So then we had 10,000 shares outstanding, now we're gonna have 50,000 shares outstanding. For every one share, you get five. And then for the um, par value, you would take the $100 and divide it by five, so the par value is gonna go down to 20, and then you would expect the market price to go down to 30. So it's gonna go down in its proportion. And then here they're just showing you that the from a balance sheet standpoint, it doesn't change dollar amount, it only changes number of shares outstanding and the par value. Now then what, what also can happen in our, in our equity accounts or our stock accounts is that the corporation could choose to go out and buy back its shares of outstanding stock. So we call that treasury stock when it does it. And they could do it, like say they give their employees stock options, they could go back and buy out you know, shares that are outstanding so that they can reissue them to the employees. Um, or maybe they give the executives of the company bonuses in stock instead of in cash. Um, or maybe they feel like the market price is too low and they want to bring a market to it so they can go out and they can buy additional shares, which will kind of create a market for those shares. And then they'll end up having treasury stock. So we normally use the cost, cost method for recording that where it's going to go into an account called treasury stock at the purchase price, whatever we pay to get it back. And the treasury stock is going to be a contra equity account, which means its normal balance is going to be a debit. 
Now then when we go to sell it back out, if we do go to sell it back out, we're gonna end up having a paid in capital account related to those treasury stock sales. Um, so if we have common stock at 500,000, we have paid in capital of 150,000, um, and then now we go out and we buy 1,000 shares at $45 a share. We debit the treasury stock for the 1,000 shares at the $45. We went out and bought it, so we got to pay cash. Then let's say, what was it, a month later or two months later, we then sell it out. So then we sell it out, but notice, let's go back, we bought it at $45 a share. Now here we're selling it out at 60, so that's great. 600 shares at $60, we get the cash. But notice down here, we're gonna credit our treasury stock at 600 shares at the $45 we paid. So our credit has to go out at the same price that it goes in. Then what? Then you look at it and say, well, gosh, we had a gain, right? We sold it for 60 when we bought it for 45. But following generally accepted accounting principles, we cannot have a gain on our own on our own stock. So instead of it going to a gain, it goes into paid in capital from the sale of treasury stock for $9,000. Now, sometimes it could go the other way. So then say now, instead of, we, we bought it for 45, but now let's say we sold it at 40. So we sold 400 shares at $40, we get $16,000 in cash, we have to take it out of the treasury stock at the price we paid. So 400 shares at $45 is 18,000. Then we have a loss, like in a, not a real loss, because again, following generally accepted accounting principles, we cannot have a loss on our own sale. <coughs> I mean, sorry, on our own stock. So then we debit that paid in capital from the sale of treasury stock. So it had a $9,000 balance in it from that first sale. Now we're gonna reduce it by 2,000 because the next sale was lower. Um, and then no dividends are paid to the, to the stock that we have in our treasury. It only goes out to outside people. Um, and then here we've got um, the, the reporting the stockholders equity on our balance sheet. So we've got each class of stock is reported followed by its related paid in capital accounts. So common stock, paid in capital um, on, on the par value and then preferred stock, paid in capital on the par value of that and then retained earnings. Now then the treasury stock would be a deduction because again, it's gonna be a debit balance in those accounts. Um, oh, then these are listed as a single item. So um, we, we add them together and, and don't show them in their separate categories. So here we've got, again, our preferred stock um, and then our common stock and then our additional capital combined together. So not shown separately as how much was preferred stock and how much was common stock. And then we've got our retained earnings down below it. And then, and then below that, we're subtracting out the treasury stock. So the treasury stock then reduces that um, equity. And then this one up on the top part shows it separately. So you've got your paid in capital with the preferred stock, your paid in capital with the common stock, and then your paid in capital with the treasury stock. So all of its, all of those paid in capitals are listed out individually. Okay, then our retained earnings, we will have a, a statement of retained earnings that's prepared um, and a statement of stockholders equity. So when we have the um, separate statement of retained earnings, we always start with our beginning of the balance of the retained earnings. We add net income and we subtract out dividends paid to get to the ending balance of the retained earnings. Um, so then again, here, beginning balance plus net income minus our two different types of dividends, gives us our ending balance in our retained earnings account. And this is what we would then trace over into our balance sheet. That would be our ending balance in um, our balance sheet for retained earnings. 
then there can be restrictions on our retained earnings so that um, maybe we can't pay out dividends on some of that money. And those would be spelled out in our notes to the financial statements. Um, and again, they could be legal based on the state that we're incorporated in. It could be contractual if we've got a bank loan and there was a debt covenant agreement that said if your net income like it's down to this certain level, level you're not to pay out any dividends. Again, it's to protect the bank and, their, and, and what they are holding as collateral. And then it could be discretionary. It could be the company's own board of directors that makes that decision to restrict those retained earnings. Prior period adjustments are mistakes that we made in the past year, and we've already prepared the financial statements and we've already closed the books. So instead of trying to open those books back up and restate those financial statements, we make um, a correction of that error and it's called a prior period adjustment and it gets posted into the retained earnings account. Again, instead of trying to open up prior statements and deal with those. Okay, then um, we've got our statement of stockholders equity, which again, here's an example of that, shows you what's all the different categories that are in there. So our preferred stock, common stock, paid in capital, retained earnings, and treasury stock, and then what type of changes happened to create their ending balances. So it kind of takes everything in that um, equity and breaks it out into the details. And then here's the stockholders equity section of our balance sheet. This one again gives us all the details of our preferred less, um, plus our paid in capital on the preferred common stock plus our excess of issue price over par, or I, I call that paid in capital, but it's the same thing. Um, retained earnings less your treasury stock gives us our total. And then that's our statement of retained earnings and then the statement of stockholders equity. Then again, as we end each chapter, we always go to our ratios. So we already talked about this earnings per share um, in the last chapter, we actually started with it, but here it is presented again. So it's our net income minus our preferred dividends divided by our average common shares outstanding. So we subtract the preferred dividends because they get paid first when they're um, that's what they're preferred. They have preference to those dividends. So this is saying what net income is attributable to those common stockholders or left to the common stockholders. So we have to subtract those dividends out. And then here they give us an example. Um, and then you definitely want that earnings per share to increase. That's always a good thing when it goes up. And then here's another example of that. And then that is our chapter on the equity part of our balance sheet.